so welcome back to Inside the Black Box. Today's Black Box is probably Nintendo's most important product from the kind of business point of view. And that is the humble uh, original Nintendo Game Boy. Uh, this came out in 1989. Um, it was one of the first big portable gaming consoles that was available. And notice I say gaming console, not portable game, because of course Nintendo had produced a whole set of uh, what they called the Game & Watch series, which was a ba uh, basically a set of uh, electronic games which played a single game, right? Uh, which was great, and they did very well during the early 80s. Those were around kind of between, I guess, 1980 and 1987 or so. Um, they made great collectibles, but in the end, it's just one game. So they had the failure that, um, you know, you'd play the game and then eventually you get bored of it, and then what do you do? Whereas the Game Boy is a real console, right? Because it came with uh, general purpose processor and then games in an actual cartridge which you could uh, you know play for a while and then when you get bored of it you just switch out and play the next game right so this gave Nintendo a product that had a very long lifespan because all they needed to do was keep producing games or have their partners uh, produce games right um, and in some sense it is this humble little machine that built the Nintendo we know today because even though Nintendo has uh, in you know, recent versions of their kind of traditional plug it to your TV consoles not done as well against the likes of Sony and Microsoft. Um, it continues to be the absolute world leader in mobile gaming, right? Um, so let's have a look at this device. Uh, there's really two things that made it be uh, the absolute world beater uh, when it came to mobile gaming. Because of course, Nintendo weren't the only people trying to do mobile gaming, right? Sega had a go at it. Uh, various other companies had a go at it, and they just never got as far as Nintendo did. And there's really two things uh, which made this machine be extremely successful, right? And so we're going to look at exactly what those two things are. <clears throat> so the Game Boy was designed by Gunpei Yokoi. He ran the famous research department one at Nintendo. Um, and the interesting thing to remember about Yokoi is that he was actually a toy maker by trade, right? He joined Nintendo um, to work on the... Uh, production lines that built uh, uh, playing cards, like regular poker type cards, right? I mean, they were Japanese games, but still. Um, and so he was kind of uh, somebody who learned engineering by himself and kind of worked his way up the company. Uh, but ultimately, he was all about making toys, right? He had worked in Nintendo designing products before they got into the computer age. So he had built some of their custom light gun games, for example, that we talked about during the uh, light gun episode. Um, and so he was somebody who understood Nintendo's mission as being, um, you know, entertaining people through electronic toys, essentially, right? Um, and so his team had built the Game of Watch series, and they had a pretty good understanding for what mobile gaming was, how people use them, or what they wanted. Uh, and so the thing that uh, Yokoi immediately realized was that if you have a device like this, which is intended to be a portable game machine, you have to have it... La uh, have a single battery charge last a long time, right? That is absolutely critical because he knew that a lot of these devices were going to be bought by parents for children and nobody is going to want to buy a device and then, you know, you spend whatever it is, $100 on it and now you have to spend, you know, $100 a year on batteries for it. So he knew we need to have very good battery life on this thing in order for it to be a success. And the Game & Watch was fantastic when it came to battery life. It ran on a single kind of those little uh, watch batteries, you know, the ones that, um, these little silver button things. And, and on one of these, it would run for, you know, many, many hours. And so he wanted to achieve the same thing on this new general purpose, essentially, Game & Watch that he was building. And so one important piece of technology that Yokoi brought over from the uh, Game & Watch is the technology used for the screen. And it uses a technology called Liquid Crystal Display, uh, which it actually turns out to be a fantastically complicated uh, chemistry behind it. The person who discovered this was a French uh, chemist called De Gen, and De Gen was actually awarded the Nobel Prize uh, for discovering liquid crystal technology. Um, and the nice thing about liquid crystals is that unlike traditional um, displays like you might find, you know, on your cell phone, uh, or perhaps, you know, a CRT TV that you would have plugged your Nintendo to, your NES, um, they require very little power. They have their downsides, right? They do require very little power, but you'd have ghosting. Uh, if you've, you know, played any of these uh, Game Boy games, you'll notice that when objects move across the screen, they kind of leave a little trail of gray behind them. So they have that downside. Um, 
But, you know, in engineering, as we've discussed before, everything's a trade-off, right? Uh, every time you gain something, you have to give up something. So Yokoi was like, well, if I want to have long battery life, I need to um, give up something. And liquid crystal displays are the way to do it. Um, so how much battery does one of these uh, Game Boys actually use? How long can you run on a single set of batteries? So let's connect this thing to the bench power supply and let's measure exactly how much battery it draws and let's try and predict how long a set of four batteries would last on this thing. So let's uh, look at how much current uh, the Game Boy draws and that'll let us know how efficient it is at using the battery. So now, as you know, the Game Boy uh, come eight uh, four AA batteries, so like this one. Um, this particular uh, AA battery I bought recently, it's a new one, it's an alkaline battery, which means it probably has around 2000 milliamp hours of current it can deliver, uh, which means that it can either deliver you uh, 2000 milliamps in one hour or one milliamp over 2000 hours, right? Um, <clears throat> now, during the late 80s, when the Game Boy would have been built, alkaline batteries were a bit more expensive. Uh, the technology they used then was a battery called zinc chloride and zinc chloride batteries would have given you about 1000 milliamp hours right so let's bear that in mind as we investigate how much current the game boy draws so now i've rigged up the game boy to my bench power supply uh, and what that'll let us do is on this bottom number we'll be able to see how many milliamps uh the game boy draws so if we see that the game draw is drawing 20 milliamps for example we know that you'll be able to play for 100 hours with it right so let's uh, let's see what happens so I've got it set to 6 volts, which is what the uh, Game Boy is, right? Four batteries, each one is 1.5 volts in series, so it's 1.5 times 4, which is 6 volts. Um, so we should be able to turn this on now and keep an eye on this bottom number to see what happens. All right, so it's immediately jumped to 36 milliamps. Uh, the little Nintendo logo comes up. Now when the game's copyright message comes up, it jumps up to 43 milliamps, which means now the code in the cartridge is running. Um, and now when the music starts playing, you see we're up at about, you know, hovering in the 44 to 46 milliamp range. Um, and I can tweak the uh, contrast, it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Uh, it's pretty much sitting at 46 milliamps, right? So now we can start a game, uh, and the number stays pretty much where it is. So it's 46 milliamps. So actually, it looks like uh, the display plus the CPU running uh, eats around 40, and then if you add the music on top of that or the sound, it gives you 46. So let's uh, round it off and call it 50 milliamps. Um, 50 milliamps on a battery that has uh, 2,000 milliamp hours means that we should have about 40 hours of gameplay off of four batteries, right? That's amazing. 40 hours of gameplay off of one set of batteries that your parents had to buy. So that is one of the reasons that the Game Boy did so well, is the fact that you know you bought one pack of batteries and it gave you a really good amount of gameplay for it. So you can see, like the battery, uh, the goal of having long battery life on this thing, they definitely achieved that, right? I mean, we are talking many, many hours out of one set of batteries. Uh, even, you know, using the kind of not as great uh, zinc chloride technology that you would have had in the 80s you know 20 hours on a battery charge that's pretty good right that's you know approaching an entire week or more of gameplay if you if you play a lot um so let's have a look at uh, the device on the outside first uh and then we'll you know tear it apart and see exactly how it works uh so this particular one i happened to get on ebay for about 25 bucks uh the guy who sold it to me said it was broken so the price was reduced um in fact, the only thing that's wrong with it is there is a couple of vertical lines that don't light up on the screen, which is something that's probably pretty easy to fix. Um, so that was probably, uh, quite a nice score. Um, so, you know, let's start off with the control panel. Um, the control layout looks almost exactly the same that the uh, Game & Watch games look. The Game & Watch uh, had the D-pad uh, with the same shape and then a single button. Uh, what they've done here is, of course, they've copied the NES controller. Uh, layout right select start BA and then the d-pad and that's nice because you know the people who are buying this have are hopefully going to become loyal uh, Nintendo customers so you want the user experience to be the same across all your products um, at the bottom here we've got a little grill behind which hides a single little piezoelectric speaker uh, you know for the purposes of these games it sounds great I mean it's all 8-bit chiptune type music so that kind of speaker sounds fine um, 
We continue at the bottom. We've got a uh, headphone jack here, uh, so you could you know play and not bother your parents with all the beeping and bopping. Um, on the side, we've got the uh, volume control, which is a single little standard wheel, very much analog control. This is before they started putting digital volume controls because in those days, that kind of digital technology was expensive. And here we've got um, a expansion port. Let's see if I can get it open. Um, and this is essentially for doing either peripherals uh, or it actually supported a network cable across two machines. I can't get this thing open. Well, never mind. We'll look at see what's inside when we take it apart. Um, continue along the top. Here is the power button. Uh, it's just a very simple um, mechanical power button. One very awesome feature of this, and this is again, you know, Nintendo when they design their products, it's all about quality. You'll notice that when I turn the power button, this little tab here kind of pops out. You see that? Why is that tab there? Very simple. When you put your cartridge in, the cartridge you'll notice has got this kind of notch missing over here. That notch, when you engage the cartridge and turn it on, actually locks the cart in place. And the reason you do that is because hot plugging a cartridge could actually cause damage to the electronics. So by that very simple means, uh, they make sure that you don't accidentally remove your cartridge. Now, of course, if you plug, you know, if you're trying to plug it hard enough, you'll snap that off. But still, you know, if you're just kind of playing, you put it down face down and you think, oh, I want to pull the card out. Well, there's something there to save your Game Boy. Really nice feature. Really nice feature. Oh, now the uh, expansion port just came open. Okay. So there's the expansion port. It looks, um, if you look at it with a modern eye, you'll say, oh, it looks just like USB. That's just a coincidence. Uh, it's got power that comes out of here so you could drive uh, devices through it. Of course, that eats up your battery sooner. And then it's got some, uh, it's just a standard serial communication port which was a very common technology for moving things across uh, two devices during the 80s, and that eventually morphed into the universal serial bus, which is in fact USB. Um, so uh, continuing uh, around the side, so we have the button on the other side of this, we have um, this thing here, which is the external uh, power source. So you can run this thing from a Woolwart, which I believe you got when you bought the device. It's just a six volt uh, power supply. Um, and if you look over here, it actually has the details of what you need. It says six volts, whether the center bit is positive or negative and so on. Um, and then this button here is labeled contrast. And what contrast does is it sets essentially the uh, background intensity of the LCD. Um, it's uh, one of the downsides of, the, of an LCD is that you have to hold it at just the right angle to view it. If you hold it, you know, if you have the thing kind of tilted at the wrong angle, you barely see it. The contrast helped with that a little bit. But still, it's kind of the device that you have to hold it just so and then hold it while you play, right? Uh, something which became much more of a problem when they made the Game Boy Advance uh, because that lacked the backlight and so it became very hard to see exactly what was going on. Um, so on the back of this then is the housing for the battery. You put in four AA's as we talked about. This actually takes up quite a large amount of space on the device. Uh, but you know, you got to put the battery somewhere uh, and it closes up into quite a nice little package. Uh, when you finished. I was quite lucky, even though this one was 25 bucks, it had the back plate, which a lot of them are missing. Uh, and at the back here, we have all the kind of uh, technical information. It's model number DMG01, copyright 1989 Nintendo, rating DC six volts at 0.7 watts. And this already kind of tells us something about the power consumption. 0.7 watts is a tiny amount of power. Think about your regular ordinary light bulb that you put in, you know, before the, uh, you know, TFT, LCD, whatever light bulbs. Uh, the average light bulb was 60 or 100 watts. So this is using less than 1% of the amount of power it takes to drive a light bulb, right? That's a nice, efficient design. Um, so let's, uh, now that we've examined it, um, before we take it apart though, one thing we should really talk about is this LCD display and the technology goes behind it because it is absolutely amazing. Um, there are in fact two Nobel Prizes that went into building the Game Boy. One is the transistors that make up the CPU, of course. Every electronic device needed that Nobel Prize. But the second Nobel Prize was the chemistry behind liquid crystal displays. So let's go to the whiteboard and talk about how liquid crystals display work and how you can use them and why it is that they use so little power. So to understand how liquid crystal display works, we first need to understand something about light and the special properties that light has. Now, uh, as you probably know, uh, light has uh, properties of both a wave and a particle. It's like a big quantum physics thing, but really it's only the wave part that we're interested in here, right? So when you look at uh, 
you know, a ray of light. Essentially, you have a wave which is coming from the source here, you know, some light bulb or something, and then to the observer here, right? Um, and the frequency of the light sets whether it's visible light or the color, right? So um, really fast uh, frequencies of light are, I think, red, the slow ones are blue, and then if you go beyond the visible light, you start getting, uh, you know, infrared light and ultraviolet light and all the rest of it. But what's interesting about these waves is not just the frequency that they have, but they also have an orientation, right? So the light can flow in an angle like this, or it could come at a different angle or anywhere in between. Uh, and so depending on the kind of light source you have, uh, you will get rays of light coming at you at various angles. So now there is a special kind of filter which is interesting that's called a polarizing filter. And what a polarizing filter does is it essentially acts like a picket fence, right? So imagine that we have a polarizing filter and it essentially has got slits. So it's got openings like this. And what this means is when you have a ray of light trying to come through, only the rays of light which have the same orientation of the slits can make it. So in this case, you'd be able to get through here because you can make through slits. But if you come this way, you would then bump up against the slits, right? Uh, so what a polarizing filter does is it basically only lets through the components of the ray of light that have got the same orientation, which is why they use polarizing filters in sunglasses, right? Because if I put this filter on, some of the light's gonna get through, but some is gonna get blocked, which means that the intensity of light you get here on this side of the filter is less. So, you know, you have sunglasses and it blocks out some amount of the light. That's how that works. So what's interesting about liquid crystal displays is what happens if we put a second polarizing filter over here, say, but we put the orientation at 90 degrees to it. So going this way, so now imagine your beam of light coming in like this, oh, hits the filter and it can't get through, so that's the end of that. But what happens if it comes through this way? It's like, oh, cool, I'm at the right orientation, I'm gonna go all the way through. Now it gets here and it's blocked because it would need to be like this to make it through, right? And it's like that. So when you have two polarizing filters at right angles to each other like this, you know, you have one like this and one like that, then no light gets through and you have complete darkness here. Now what's cool about this is you would be able to get light here if there was some way to take this ray of light and then twist it such that it would make it through. Then it would work, right? Because if we had some kind of like, you know, like a uh, heavy trail, hamster kind of trail thing which would twist the light through so it made it through, then you would have no problem. And that's actually what a uh, liquid crystal display does. The molecules of the liquid crystal actually have a twist to them naturally, right? So what they do is when light shines through them, they are kind of like a light cable that twists the ray of light to come through. And this is their kind of natural state. If you take the kind of liquid crystal that you find inside the Game Boy, um, which has been very carefully manufactured, of course, it's a very complicated chemical process. But if you take one of those molecules, by, on its natural state, it has this twist. And so it allows light through. Now, why is that interesting? Here's why it's interesting, because I can change the shape of this molecule by passing electricity through it. And that's where the magic that Dijen discovered comes in. If I pass electricity along some angle, the molecules will want to align themselves with that. So let's say I pass, you know, one volt across here. What will happen is, draw these in a different color, the molecules will suddenly align themselves with the electricity. So now, your beam of light's coming in and it doesn't get twisted and now it butts up against this and can't get through. So now what we've done is by making this, adding an electric charge across here, we've essentially made this be a black pixel because no light is gonna get through. And now if I stop passing electricity through, what happens is the molecules rearrange themselves back to their natural shape. Right? So now when a beam of light comes through, it gets twisted and makes it. So you end up with a situation where if you've got some voltage, the pixel is black. And if you've got no volts, then the pixel is clear. So now I have the beginnings of a screen because I can, for every pixel on the screen, decide by passing a voltage to it or not, whether light is gonna go through or not. And the cool thing is that it's not just a you know, all black or all white kind of thing. I can pass some voltages in between here, maybe like half a volt, right? 
And what will happen is some of the uh, liquid crystal molecules will untwist and some will not, so that only some of the light will go through. And that way I can make shades of gray, right? Because if I make, kind of make the twist be less, then yeah, you know, some of the things will get twisted and some not, so you'll end up with this kind of, you know, half on, half off state. And that's why the Game Boy is able to show you, you know, your, the 16 shades of gray, because it can control the voltage that goes to each of these pixels, and then, you know, you will let more or less light in. So the only thing we need then to complete this image, or complete the screen, is a light source here, right? We need some light to kind of come through. So that's why the Game Boy has, you know, a light source at the back here, and it's at the back. That's why it's called the backlight, right? Seems kind of obvious. And that is what generates the color to go through. Now you don't need a backlight, of course, because there's also light coming in from, from the screen, like the sun and stuff, right? And that will also get twisted or not in exactly the same way. So it is possible to have these screens, like if you've got your cheap alarm clock and it's got the little, you know, seven segment display, which is also liquid crystal, they don't use a backlight, they just rely on the natural light. But if you want, you know, a nice clear use in any, uh, amount of light, ambient light kind of display, then you want to have your backlight. And that's of course a mistake Nintendo made when they made the Game Boy Advance, which didn't have a backlight. And it was really hard to see what was going on, right? So one additional thing that's interesting here is the fact that we are relying on these molecules to basically twist and untwist themselves as we turn voltages on or off. That takes some time. It's not instantaneous, right? It takes some amount of time for the molecules to twist and untwist. That is why in the original Game Boy, which used, you know, the very early forms of this technology, you would kind of see ghosting in the image, right? Because what's happening is when you tell the pixel, hey, turn yourself to black, it takes a little time for that to happen. So you will see some shades of gray in between. And when you tell it go from black to clear, it'll take a little while. And that's why you see ghosting in the image. Now, this has been solved in modern displays by using essentially better chemistry behind these uh, liquid crystal molecules, which will be able to change their shapes faster. And you know, in the modern displays, that's like, you know, a fraction of a millisecond. Just, you can't even see the amount of ghosting that is left. Uh, but in the early displays, which are, of course, cheap, because uh, Nintendo is trying to make a device that, you know, anybody can buy, uh, you would have had this amount of ghosting. Okay, so I've just finished taking all the screws off. Uh, so let's open this up really carefully. Oh, okay, there we go. So it opens up kind of like a book, like a lot of electronics do. Um, we essentially have got two halves to it, right? There's this part here, which is the display and the controls. And then there is this uh, part here, which is actually the back of the device. Uh, so we've got this big motherboard here, which is, as we'll see, the bulk of the electronics, the memory, the CPU, and so on. And then we've got this white uh, thing here that is actually the battery. And then just behind here is the uh, slot for the cartridge. So let's separate this out. So this is just kind of... Uh, this cable actually connects the display, so the screen, to the uh, um, the actual CPU. So you can think of it as your tiny monitor cable. Oh, there we go. Put that aside. Uh, and so this is then uh, the bulk of the electronics, right? The cartridge slot over here, and then you've got the processor here. So let's open that up. Uh, there is this little guy down here. Um, he's kind of just, uh, you can see he's connected to the um, headphone jack. Uh, he's really, they've got a couple of caps here for doing sound filtering. So if there's buzz from the batteries or whatever, it doesn't make it through to your headphone, right? So nothing super interesting there. Uh, but let's free up this main CPU because this is where the action is going to be. Just two screws, take those off. Okay, let's see. And there we go. Okay. All right, let's flip that around and have a look. So essentially what we have here is uh, this black thing here is the cartridge slot. Um, you can see the cartridge fits right in there. Um, and then next to it is the bulk of your electronics, which are these chips. So uh, let's uh, zoom in and have a look at that. Okay, so you can see as with the other uh, Nintendo products, everything's really nicely labeled. This one's labeled DMG CPU. DMG is the uh, kind of code name for the um, Game Boy, right? The model number is DMG01. Um, we've got all these things here, DA123, everything is kind of labeled nicely and that, as we've discussed in the part, that helps with both assembly and quality checking. Now if you notice these uh, uh, CPUs look slightly different to the ones I've looked at in the past, uh, this is a technology which is called surface mount technology, so in other words the little legs of the CPU don't go through the board, they're kind of floating on top. 
Uh, this is something that was already being used more broadly during the late 80s. It basically allows you to uh, have more of your manufacturing be automated, right? So this would have been a lot of this built by robots and not by people anymore. Um, and that's really essential if you want to have small electronics, right? You uh, having to have the through hole electronics makes the PC board need to be bigger. Uh, this kind of automated built robot built stuff can be a lot more compact, right? So that's important if you're building a portable device. Uh, so this, see, uh, we've got this chip here and then these two. There's a kind of tiny little one tucked away behind uh, this uh, capacitor here. That one is actually not super interesting. That's just for controlling power. This little black block is actually the uh, external power in, right? Uh, so you put in your six volt here. This guy will knock it down to, you know, five volts, which is what this thing uses internally and make sure that you don't have like power spikes blowing things up, etc. Um, over here, we've got the silver thing, which is the uh, external, the serial cable that we talked about, right? Uh, this is the um, backlight, I think. No, sorry, that is the volume control. The backlight is on the uh, LCD PC board. Uh, so we got three chips here to talk about. Let's start off with uh, the smaller ones. They both have the same code on them. LH5264N4, built by Sharp Japan. Um, these are memory, right? That's your RAM. Uh, which the game uses for doing temporary storage, you know, while you need to do calculations or whatever, that's where they store. Each one of these is 4K, so you have 8 kilobytes um, combined. Now, 8 kilobytes, you might think that's not a huge amount of storage, but actually, in 1989, that was not bad. Uh, you think about the Commodore 64, which was considered to be amazing for how much memory it had, and that had about 48 kilobytes that a programmer could use. Uh, the Sinclair Spectrum had 8K. By default, you could put in an expansion for more. Uh, the Atari 2600 had half a kilobyte. So, you know, 8K, not too bad, actually. Uh, much more interesting, though, is this big guy in the middle here. Uh, he's called DMG-CPU-A, and it says copyright 1989 Nintendo Japan. Now, even though it says copyright uh, Nintendo, this chip would actually have been manufactured by Sharp. Nintendo didn't have factories capable of manufacturing computer chips. Uh, certainly not CPUs anyway, um, but you know, Sharp did it under license and they put the Nintendo brand. Uh, if you open up other Game Boys, you might see that this A changes to a B. There were a couple of revisions, uh, so some of them have got a slightly more advanced form of the chip. Not that the games are any different, you know, but they would have been perhaps you know easier to manufacture, or maybe they were a little better on power consumption, etc. Um, now, what's interesting is what this chip actually is, and this is really a Zilog Z80 uh, with a couple of extra instructions in it. So. It's in essence the same chip that the Timex Sinclair TS-1000 had or the ZX Spectrum, right? So it's actually a pretty old CPU. Um, now, why would Nintendo in 1989 decide to use a chip that was manu you know, designed and built in 1978 or so? And the answer is again, power consumption, right? The speed that a CPU goes at is actually critical in understanding how much power it uses. Because think of it this way. Assume that a single operation that a CPU does takes some amount of energy to consume. I mean, it's got to take some amount of energy, right? You'll get nothing for free. So if I'm going to do, say, a thousand operations per second, it's going to use up some amount of power. Now, if I do a hundred operations in a second, I'm going to use 10 times less power, right? Because I'm just doing less work in a given unit of time. That means that if I have a CPU that does a thousand operations per second, you know, it might eat a battery, say, in 10 hours. But if I'm doing only 100 operations per second and using 10% of the power, that same battery, instead of lasting 100 hours, is going to last 1,000 hours, right? So by using an older underpowered CPU, it, that's one of the ways in which Nintendo controlled not just the cost of the machine, because obviously older CPUs are cheaper, right? The newest fancy stuff is always more expensive. But you also control the amount of battery consumption that you have. Um, now, you might say, hang on, but why didn't they just put a powerful CPU and then let the guys writing the programs, right, the, the game developers, let the game developer decide, oh, I want to do a lot of work or a very little amount of work. Remember, that's not Nintendo's game design philosophy, right? Their game design philosophy in the 80s is we want to control the quality, uh, the perceived quality of our products by making sure that only good games make it through. In the context of the Game Boy, a good game is one that doesn't kill your battery. So you don't want to put the... 
uh, amount of battery life essentially in some third party developer's hands. You want to control it yourself. So by using an underpowered CPU, you force game developers to not use a lot of battery uh, when designing their games. And you know, if you look at some of the games that were released for this thing, they were actually quite good. So you know, even having an underpowered CPU, it just means that you have to get creative about how you write your game, right? Uh, so that's essentially the, the buck of it. And it's not a very big uh, PC board. Actually, we can measure this. Let me get my calipers out. So this guy is about, what is that? Like three and a half inches wide or so. Uh, you think about the NES, which had you know, not a very different amount of performance. I mean, the CPU they used was a bit more powerful, but it had equivalent amounts of RAM, and that PC board was, you know, eight or nine inches long. So that's an amazing feat of miniaturization, considering it's only like, you know, five years older than the Famicom or the NES. Okay, let's look at the top half now. Uh, so this top half really is the screen. So we've got the speaker at the bottom. This is the uh, volume control. Uh, everything's super well labeled. You can see here, it's a 30K resistor, this thing here. Um, you've got the copyright 989 uh, Nintendo DMG LCD 05, right? So uh, DMG LCD 05, that means that this circuit board supports your liquid crystal display and it's revision 5, right? So by this stage, it would already have been kind of trying to improve it and so on. So let's uh, take the screws off this one. It is held in place by many screws. And the reason for that is liquid crystal displays are essentially sandwiched uh, between several layers of glass, right? You've got your polarizing filter at the back, polarizing filter at the front, and then there are two layers of glass that actually hold the liquid crystal material between them. So you have to be absolutely sure that there is going to be no twisting of that entire glass sandwich, because if it twists, um, it could crack. And if it cracks, your liquid crystals will flow out and you'll kind of lose your display. Uh, and in a system like this, you not only have the liquid crystals, but of course they have to be separated into little tiny squares, each of which is a pixel, right? So it's absolutely essential that we don't uh, twist the display. And you'll find that all machines that have a liquid crystal like this are, uh, have got, you know, the structural integrity of the body is kind of beefed up to make sure they don't twist. Now, I'll spare you all the uh, amount of time it took me to discover that I had forgot to undo one screw over there. That's why I wasn't coming out. All right, we're all loose now. So let's very carefully flip this around. And there we go. That is the liquid crystal matrix, right? It's called a matrix because remember, it's a grid. Uh, each one of those little tiny cells, we can pass a voltage to to make the uh, liquid crystal twist and untwist. Uh, and that then becomes your display, right? So. <clears throat> There are some interesting things going on here. So we've got this cable coming out, which has got many, many pins to it. Uh, I, we can count them and see one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is probably about 24 pins. Uh, and then it kind of continues through the circuit board along to these drivers over here. Let's see if we can actually lift this out a little more. There are some snaps here. There we go trying to be careful so we don't break this otherwise perfectly working Game Boy. Uh, I've got one more somewhere. Oh, there's two little screws on this side. Let's remove those. There's one, and there's the other one. I can only lift the screen a little bit. It's kind of soldered in place in two different sets of places, and I'll show you where. Under here, there is a kind of strip which is uh, connecting it. Uh, let's see if I can point it right there. So there's a strip of cables which is going from the uh, motherboard here up to the display on this side, so longitudinally. And then we have another one here, this strip there, which is connected to essentially through this black ribbon. This is just a cable, right? This thing, fancy looking thing. To a strip here horizontally. So essentially what you have is two sets of cables, one that is attaching this way and then one that is attaching this way. And the reason we have that is we need to be able to, in order to light up a single pixel on the screen, we need to be able to indicate which row and column uh, to pass the voltage to, right? And so a lot of what the display driver does is it's able to encode and decode based on the program uh, which pixel to light up or not light up. And the resolution on one of these screens is, I think, uh, 
160 by 144 pixels so not very much we would call it about 30,000 pixels I guess um, and so for each of those 160 rows and you know to, uh, 140 columns 160 rows uh, you're able to send a single signal right just a set of volts uh, whatever it is one volt I think it is on the on the Game Boy and that then essentially causes the uh, liquid crystal molecule to unwrap itself to then block light coming through right and that's how that works so the other interesting thing down here uh, is these little things contacts here this is the exact same technology that the uh, NES used to do um, the controls right these are conductive rubber uh, you've got on the actual pads you've got these little rubber pads here when they squish against that then it closes the circuit and that's how you do your button input so that then is what's inside a Game Boy and actually it's extremely interesting because it shows more than anything the kind of design philosophy that Yokoi and his engineers had in building this device right they were very clear from the outset battery life is must be king in this project and they engineered everything you know all the key components were selected uh, for that goal the CPU which is underpowered right I mean even for the time uh, it was kind of crazy to say hey we're going to use a five or six year old CPU in our brand new project uh, you know that must have been a hard sell for Yokoi to the board of directors at Nintendo <clears throat> and then of course the liquid crystal display which has some downsides like the ghosting etc but combined this whole package ends up drawing you know no more than 50 milliamps while playing and you get this fantastic you know 20 30 hours out of one set of batteries and you know you can say what you want about the design yeah the graphics are ugly or the games aren't great it worked right this became an absolute bestseller it got lots of kids hooked not only onto gaming but onto becoming loyal nintendo consumers uh, and so this device probably kicked off the kind of wave of supremacy that Nintendo had about uh, mobile gaming. And there's a kind of cute story about uh, Gunpei Yokoi and um, their choices around, you know, the technology they did. Uh, supposedly, I don't know, it's, you know, I, I don't work in Nintendo, I don't know if these things are true or not, but supposedly when they were almost finished building uh, the Game Boy, uh, one of Yokoi's engineers came in and said, oh my word, Gunpei, we're all screwed because one of our competitors is also building a uh, portable gaming machine um, and the first question that Yokoi asked him was is it color or black and white um, and then the engineer replied well it's really bad because it's color and Yokoi just laughed and said oh if it's color we are totally fine right because he understood that a color display uh, would not be able to have the battery savings that the black and white LCDs did and therefore you know that's it they were fine because their competitor was going to use way too many bat too much battery life and they would win right and it turned out to be true no one really knows what that uh, mythical competitor was uh, perhaps it was a Sega Game Gear nobody really knows um, of course a uh, little bit further down the line you know when the Game Boy Color came out the reason you were able to do the Game Boy Color was because LCD technology had matured to the point that you could have uh, colors and the way color LCDs work is you essentially have um, three different backlights and three different sets of liquid crystals right red green and blue and so you uh, you independently control the amount of red green or blue light that comes up to the surface and that's how you do your color mixing um, also uh, the technology they used here the liquid crystals you were only able to produce uh, four different shades of gray um, you know more modern variations that you do you know higher higher different uh, amounts of, of uh, light that gets through and so, you know, when you get to something like the uh, 3DS, um, you get this fantastic, beautiful, crisp display with as many shades of color as a real TV does um, because you're using these absolutely fantastic modern variations of liquid crystal. So there you go. That is the Nintendo Game, uh, Nintendo Game Boy, probably the most important thing that Nintendo ever produced. I uh, hope you enjoyed that trip down memory lane into two Nobel Prizes worth of engineering into your gaming device. Um, the next time we look at a device, it's going to be another Nintendo project, but this time one that did really bad. Uh, not everything that uh, Nintendo or Yokoi's team produced was a hit. And so the next one we'll look will be an absolute potato. So I hope you enjoy that. Uh, take care, and we'll see you for the next one.